something was going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day fans and welcome to another exciting episode of Talk Nerdy to Me. You know things are going absolutely awesome. Oh, I was about to say not a single person has signed in yet, but now the numbers are starting. <laughs> a couple of people are watching us. I was thinking, it's a Friday night. What on earth are you doing at home? Get out about on the town. But hey, if you're going to join us, then um, at least you can say we got the intro right this time. We didn't balls it up like we did last week. <laughs> How embarrassment. And uh, it's all very, very exciting. Now, but before I get too far into it, Got to welcome my co-host Jeffro and MPS lads. How are we tonight? Oh, all oh, good, dude. How are you? Uh, a discussion about superhero films. Um, and before MPS kicks this off, I guess it'll always be up to the individual person to say what they class as their best uh, or what is the best. Uh, most people sort of tend to pick favourites, and because obviously some are higher up the food chain than others. But this is sort of a bit of a selection. Uh, of some of the ones that uh, the three of us are all, all put together for various reasons. Uh, but I'm going to pass this over to MPS because this is more his forte than uh, uh, Jeff and myself. But uh, there we go, dude. I'm going to pass it over to you. Here's your screen and off you go. All right. So basically we're talking about superhero films, not the superhero. Well, we, we've, we can do TV shows and other related things later on. But this was just the films that have come out uh, over the years. Now, we, we discussed the top ten. I uh, actually pulled out 13, but I sort of grouped a few of them together, so you'll understand why shortly. But the first one we've got, we go all the way back to 1979 with Spider-Man, The Dragon's Challenge. Now I remember seeing this at the drive-in. My mum took me, and God, I don't think I've seen it since. Uh, I did love a lot about it. I don't remember much of it, uh, but a couple of scenes here with Spidey, which was... Um, uh, in a rather weird sort of suit. And if you have a look at it, if you can see his eyes, they're actually, it looks like someone's got sunglasses and just stuck them yeah, under the costume, which was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, the next couple of films are gonna to group to one. So Superman, Superman uh, two, and we'll come back to these in a second, uh, and Supergirl. So the first two Superman films and Supergirl film now, Back then, in uh, 1978, you could believe that a man can fly, and I love this film. Uh, even though I'm a big Batman fan, this is still one of my favourites. There's some great stuff in it. Uh, if you watch the, um, the DVDs or the Blu-rays and the deleted scenes and some of the history and stuff behind it, um, and especially with Superman 2 and, and the Richard Donner uh, cut, uh, you'll be surprised it actually even ever got made, basically. Uh, and what I've done is I've put up posters, which I remember having as a kid, uh, up on the walls, and I love this poster of Superman sitting there, which is actually, you know, on top of uh, a rooftop in the middle of New York, because the Twin Towers are behind him. Uh, and again, the same thing happens with Superman too. If you look right in the very background, just underneath him, uh, there are the Twin Towers. So it's very much New York. And what's sort of weird about all of this is Supergirl set in New York as well, but kind of not really. It just seems weird that you've got these two super beings living in the one sort of place, even though they don't really live there. Uh, and the crossover between these two uh, sort of things is the fact that Jimmy Olsen makes an appearance in Supergirl. So you see um, Mark McClure uh, hanging out over there and turns around and says, oh, you know, you must be sort of Supergirl, you know, Superman's cousin. So they're two sort of, well, kind of franchises, I guess. You know, this one is a Spider-Man, and we'll get to another one later on. Uh, but the Super series... Uh, and don't get me wrong, I do like three and four as well, but they're way down my list of films. Way, way down the list of films. So, uh, and Dags, you can jump in for the next one because the next one's another group uh, for me. So you guys can jump in and, and go for yours. All right. So, okay, beauty. So I'm just going to share this. Okay. So, Jeffro, this is up to you, man. This is one of yours. Now, this is a movie that actually came out but was never officially released. And in terms of fan circles, it was talked about for decades. So this actually is a, um, a production that began its life because there was a German producer that optioned the rights for the Fantastic Four very cheaply back in the, uh, the late 80s. 
So in order to be able to keep the rights to be able to make something um, better later on, he actually enlisted the, um, uh, the talents of uh, director Roger Corman, who is best known for putting out uh, probably the B-grade movies that uh, um, are the B is to B, so to speak, to actually make something uh, that would allow him to say, well, listen, I fulfilled my rights, I made the movie, I get to keep the option. So that was his goal. Uh, now, his rights were scheduled to finish on the 31st of December, 1992. And it was only in September of that year that he actually put it towards Roger Corman, can you please put something together? So wholly, uh, you know, sh short-term uh, movie-making Batman. So, and, and this is what he did. He actually uh, took it very seriously. He wasn't given a huge budget at all, as you could well imagine. But the people that he got to uh, work on this movie I mean, they were big fans of Fantastic Four, so there was a lot of love and a lot of heart. So um, on the uh, the left-hand side there, uh, that's actually Alex Hyde-White. Uh, and if you uh, know your um, uh, actors at all, he's actually the son of Wilfred Hyde-White, who you may remember from uh, Buck Rogers uh, Series 2. And uh, up the top on the right, that's actually Joseph Culp. And if that name sounds familiar, you probably remember that name, uh, Culp from Robert Culp, you might have seen in uh, Greatest American Hero and I Spy. So these are the, uh, the sons of these uh, famous actors. Now, as it was, the, uh, the, the money ran out on this production, no, no surprises there, and it wasn't quite complete. And you actually had uh, a lot of the, uh, the people that were working behind the scenes, sneaking into edis, editing suites overnight and cutting things together, putting in special effects where they could like sort of almost guerrilla style filmmaking. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing more about the making of this movie uh, on Amazon Prime is the, uh, the documentary called Doomed, the untold story of Roger Com's Fantastic Four. Uh, I've got it on Blu-ray. I highly recommend it. It is so fascinating. And and in that, they interview most of the cast, a lot of the crew, and you'll just see how much love went into this production. And when you watch it, it is a very enjoyable movie. It is on uh, YouTube in certain places. Um, I managed to pick it up from um, uh, a website that had a, a Blu-ray copy, and, and they said it was the best copy that was in existence, and it, it was good. But uh, as I said, if you get a chance to see the movie, go see it. But the documentary is on Prime, and I highly suggest uh, watching that. Cool. Is that is sorry? Is uh, is the kid on the, at the back? Is that Jay Underwood? It is Jay Underwood. Well done. Uh, the boy who could fly. That's right. I thought there so. I didn't think anyone would actually know who Jay Underwood was, but uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll kudos kudos to you. If you know um, your house of cards, doesn't an Underwood become president? Anyway, let's move on, shall we? Yep. So the uh, the next movie we have is uh, one that is a um, a cult favourite, the Toxic Avenger. So as the uh, as the title card says, he was an 80, 98 pounds of solid nerd until he became the Toxic Avenger. So hang on, we're all solid nerds, aren't we? <laughs> we are, but. Um, so this 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 came out in 1984, and it and you can best describe it as a an American superhero black comedy splatter film. I had to read that off the the cue card there. So whilst it didn't make a big impact in the cinemas, uh, with videotapes and video rentals around that time, it really skyrocketed. So uh, this is the movie that if you've ever heard of the um, uh, Troma Studios, who were famous for doing things like Tromeo and Juliet, um, <laughs> Class of Newcomb High, yep. all these really schlocky titles. This is the thing that basically launched them. Uh, this movie, not only was it a big hit on, um, on video, but it actually spawned three sequels. Uh, and there was also famously a, um, 
a kids cartoon show which i do remember at the time and it's weird this is like an r-rated movie but it spawned a, a, a kids television show and there was also a stage musical and a video game so how good is that anyway uh the story if you uh, don't know it is all about melvin third so he's a janitor in a gymnasium and he is um, constantly picked on so uh at one stage the jocks really set him up for a uh, a prank and then um after he's humiliated he's almost uh forced to back off and he falls out a window and he falls into a drum of toxic waste and then after setting himself on fire from the toxic waste somehow that miraculously turns him into the um, the toxic avenger uh, uh deformed as you can see there but with uh, superhuman strength and size so his his role after becoming the toxic avenger is to fight crime and bad guys and and he does it in such a, a way that the the violence is very much over the top and um one of the things that he uses is that mop that you see in the uh, the picture so uh, i won't describe some of the things he does with that mop but that was his uh, <laughs> signature calling card so he's here uh, to clean up the city yep that's it clean up the city that's right so um so in the end uh there's a uh, a mayor in the movie of tromaville and uh he's he's made to look as if he's like the evil villain and such but fortunately he manages to uh save the day and um get himself back as the hero because the people of tromaville didn't uh believe the mayor so um in the end um melvin uh, as the uh, thank you for the people of Tromaville and to get the angry mayor who uh, was really sneaky and nasty. He actually Jeff pulled... Rose, spoiler alert, mate. I'm looking forward to seeing this movie, giving it all away. The mayor's a bad guy. Toxic Avengers a good it's, guy. It's Dude, only 35 mate. years old. Let's just, let's just say that um, uh, the mayor doesn't have any guts anymore. That's, yeah, uh, that's, right. that's the tagline for that one. Very good. What's next? The, uh, the next one we have is a more recent movie, Captain Underpants. So this is a, um, uh, a movie that was a result of a very successful uh, kids' book line. So uh, I remember reading uh, some of these cartoons and uh, stories to, uh, to Josh, and that's sort of what got me uh, hooked onto it. Now, it's, um, it's all about the two kids that you see there, George and Harold, and they uh, they attend the Jerome Horowitz Elementary School, and they have a principal who is a real uh, nasty pasty. I was just trying to think the words there, nasty pasty to them. So he's always taking away their comic books, making them do detention, and all that. So one day in a cereal packet, yes, this is true. They actually got a a toy 3D hypno ring. And they thought, well, I wonder if we can hypnotize the uh, the principal and that way he won't pick on us. And believe it or not, uh, it worked. But it worked in a um, uh, a reverse way because the principal was looking at some of the comics that these two kids drew and suddenly he thought he was um, a superhero. But he wasn't. He was just basically the uh, principal wearing underpants and a curtain wrapped around his um, uh, neck. So he actually was doing all sorts of things that led to him actually not fortunately being killed, but it wasn't until um, another professor joined the school. And this name, I'm just going to make sure I get it right, is Professor P.P. Dyerstein Poopy Pants Esquire. <laughs> so he, he's, a, he's a German accented scientist. Aren't, they, aren't all the good bad guys uh, German accented? So he joins the school. And he comes up with something called a Turbo Toilet 2000. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Stick with me, folks. Uh, and that's an evil invention that was uh, taken out of one of the kids' comic books. Then he was using that to sort of take over the whole world. Uh, things went awry, and um, the garbage that they were using to feed the Turbo Toilet uh, went all toxic. And Captain Underpants uh, fell into that, and then suddenly he became superhuman. Sounds a bit like a toxic ninja. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, believe it or not, 
this movie actually made 125 million dollars on a budget of 38 million so um it's it's one of those things i guess you have to be a a, a parent to sort of appreciate and share with your kid but uh yeah that's captain underpants very good um Collins made a point of saying that uh, Lloyd Kaufman uh, came to Australia for Armageddon, so that would have been a few years ago. So uh, the, actually, I think I remember that too because he was uh, in charge of Trimer and he came down, so that was uh, all very good. And some people got the meeting, which is very, very groovy. So there you go. So effectively, Captain Underpants is about a dude with a mental health issue. Is that right? Well, pretty much because it just means that uh, unless they throw uh, water on him, then he doesn't revert back to the original principle. So it's okay. one of those Jekyll and Hyde things. So if he gets water on him, he yeah. suddenly turns into Captain Underpants. But um, if water gets thrown on him, then he becomes the principal again. So he doesn't know oh. what's happening. So what you need as a bit of merchandising is actually underwear that actually has Captain Underpants written on it. I reckon that'd be kind of funny, don't you I'm think? I'm sure so, there probably is. Extra yes, large. Very good. Well done, Jeffro. Uh, a good little summary there of some really unique and interesting ones. Um, for myself, uh, I'll be a little bit uh, shorter in terms of what I'm going to cover off because I'm not going to go into great detail. But I was looking at it from the point of view of saying, okay, there's a lot of superhero movies out there. I'm not necessarily a superhero fan, but what are the ones that I thought were really, really good that really worked for me that I pressed my buttons? Um, so the first one for me, and this is in no particular order, it's not like from first to worst or whatever, uh, I was always impressed with Unbreakable. Um, and I was even very impressed with the idea that in the reviews, people said it's well, like one of the best superhero movies ever made because you don't realise it's a superhero film, but it is. And uh, with um, Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson. And it's a very interesting story, the concept being that, uh, and this is where they got the idea from, what if Superman lived with us here on Earth but didn't know he, he was Superman? And when you think about it that way, it makes a lot of sense and it makes the story very, very interesting. And, of course, um, uh, Samuel L's character realises that if he's a weakling who is, like, very, like, per not impervious, what's the opposite to impervious? Um, can always get injured on a regular oh. basis. There must brittle. be the... What? Sorry, what? He's brittle. Thank you. He's brittle. Then there must be the opposite to him somewhere, and of course he's uh, you know, causing all these events, trying to find this super being. And the story behind it is actually, uh, I found, really good, really interesting, and very different. And that's the key thing. So there's no flying around the place, and there's no blowing up cities, and you know all the sort of super, this typical superhero tropes. And uh, it's a lot more cerebral and, and intelligent. And of course. Samuel L's character um, uh, runs a um, like a collector sphere, a collector shop for comics, and um, that, that's actually quite interesting because that's the kind of thing you don't normally see uh, in movies. You, typically, if you see comic related things, it's all to do with comic book stores, but not actually celebrating the art uh, of what comic uh, comics are. And of course, there were two follow up films for this. Um, the second one was Split uh, with James McAvoy, uh, and that only became a sequel right at the very very end when they introduced the characters from the first movie and then they s fixed it up in a third film called Glass. And, of course, uh, Samuel L's character uh, as a bad guy was called Mr Glass. And uh, But if you've never seen Unbreakable, it's an M. Night, I can't pronounce his name, Shyamalan or uh, whatever it is. Well, Shyamalan. Yeah, I can never get it right. I've, I've been trying for years and I can't get it right. But uh, absolutely uh, fantastic and very different um, and uh, well worth having a good look at if you haven't seen it already. Um, one of the ones that I really, really did love was Spider-Man 2 from 2004, if I correctly, yep, 2004. Um, sure, there's been a lot of Spider-Man movies, in fact, all the ones that, from the Tobey Maguire era right through to the current stuff, but what really pushed my buttons in this film, when I first saw it, I was really dialed into the human emotion side of the story. It wasn't all about the action and all the craziness, the whole thing about Paul Peter Parker trying to make his way in life, and I really loved the fact that Dr. Octopus wasn't necessarily a bad guy. He was just a guy who killed his wife and he obviously had a lot, you know, in this um, uh, experimental accident and he obviously went off the rails a little bit and he's trying to sort himself out. And I really appreciated that rather than just having a typical bad guy who's bad for the sake of being bad. And I thought that was actually, uh, it worked on a lot of levels. And I was just reading about it today and it still rates right up there as one of the best of the super uh, superhero films. And uh, of because the, the first movie was great and the third I'd enjoyed, but the middle one was an absolute winner. And uh, it's worth it alone for the train sequence when Spider-Man stops the train from crashing and his the mask comes off and all the people see him and they were all going to say, they're not going to say who he is and they're going to keep his identity secret. And it's absolutely fantastic and well worth it for that. And you do feel for Peter 
throughout the show because he's just trying to get his life into gear and uh, it's just not happening. So, uh, yeah, you got to feel for the guy. But, yeah, definitely of the Spider-Man movies right up the very top, in my opinion. Uh, and the third one for my section just for right now, uh, I thought about it the other day and I thought The Shadow. I absolutely adore The Shadow. What evil lurks in the hearts of men? The Shadow knows. It was made in the 1990s with Russell Mulcahy, who's renowned for smashing windows left, right, and center. And sure enough, they did that in this movie, set in the 1920s or 30s, if I recall. And, you know, it got bad reviews and, like, a lot of people didn't like it, but it's developed a cult following as it's gone along with Alec Baldwin. And it's just a nice, groovy movie to watch. Excellent movie uh, music by Jerry Goldsmith with a fantastic song uh, by Taylor Dane, written by Jim Steinman. And it is just fun. Um, there are some elements that you can say, okay, a little bit silly, a little bit dumb, but overall, the imagery, the style, the concept, the way it works, uh, and look at the poster, absolutely fantastic poster. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, something that I thought of, and I thought, you know what, I can really go with the shadow. That uh, sort of pushes my buttons. And, uh, yeah, so I had to hunt down for ages to find a widescreen version on uh, DVD, but eventually I did, and, uh, yeah, it's, it sort of rates right up there. So it goes alongside the Rocketeer uh in a uh, in a lot of ways so but unfortunately these days it's been mostly overlooked so so that's my top three at this stage now ps do you want to go back to you yeah why not okay cool so all right we're jumping to mps there we go off you go sir well i'm going to pick off the obvious one for me and the one that i always thought was the weirdest poster choice because it cut off the two sides of the bat symbol what do you yeah. think about that yeah piss me off i never bought them for that reason so yeah but for for, for whatever reason it's so, it sort of kind of works, uh, but I love the colouring, even though that's not the symbol that's on his chest for the first film, uh, which is a bit sort of bizarre. Um, and obviously you got your, your Michael Keaton and your uh, Jack Nicholson there, which is the, the funny part about that is Batman's meant to be 6'2", and Michael Keaton's like 5'9". Mm -hmm. So it was kind of weird seeing him the same size. But everything about the film is great, even though it's not close to any of the comic books at all. Then the follow-up, Batman Returns, because that was one of the better uh, sequels to any sort of film series, Superman, Superman 2, Batman, Batman Returns, uh, which was, well, it was classed as darker, even though it really wasn't. It was close to the comic books, uh, and that's why the third one, Batman Forever, was sort of told to, to lighten up a bit, uh, and they did, and they lost everything that they'd sort of worked towards uh, in these two films. Um, but also, this had a massive poster um display so there was several different versions of the posters so obviously the the bottom right is the symbol uh and then each one each character had their own sort of individual poster which was kind of cool at the same time uh then there was the double or the triple poster so all three of them are in there and i think no, i thought I'll i had the just go back yeah that one there i've got that as a billboard it actually goes on the side of a bus yeah. so there you anyway continue <laughs> yeah i missed out on any one of those because the video store closed just before i could get it uh, but there's also the other one, this one, uh, where they're all on top of each other, which was a kind of interesting sort of take on it. And for whatever reason, these posters, I love them. You know, uh, forget the fact that Max Shrek is in there as a new character that's built as a bad guy as well, but he sort of fights Bruce Wayne a little bit more than anything else. And the other Batman one I love, which is Batman Begins. Uh, so I'm going to forget Batman Forever and Batman and Robin ever existed. I'm going to forget Bat, uh, the Dark Knight ever existed. And the Dark Knight Rises might as well have never existed because I think that is one of the most terrible f Batman films ever made. Uh, but Begins is very close to Batman Year One in the comic books. A lot of the little sneaky parts uh, are brought into, especially towards the end where he actually, um, where, where Commissioner Gordon says to him, there's only two of us. He goes, well, I brought back up and he presses the, the button on his boot and it brings all the bats. That happens in Batman Year One in the comic book and it's a brilliant scene in the comic book. They kind of got it close there. So uh, the fact that they also introduced Ra's al Ghul, which was good. He's never been introduced into a live action film or series before. Uh, although I didn't like the way they did his history. He was meant to be sort of uh, slightly immortal in a sense, but here he's just a dude who's been around for a little bit. So the Batman sort of films another sort of trilogy and also the colorings in this these posters are sort of interesting too because all of them had that sort of sun look with the orange and the dark orange and that sort of thing and it sort of it gave you an, a, a bit of an ominous feel which i kind of liked as well so that's sort of the batman series 
I'm going back to Spider-Man 1, 2002, uh, Tobey Maguire, and this because there were a few things that didn't make any sense, like how we got the actual suit, and, you know, you, you just go buy it down the local sports store or whatever the case is. But some of the scenes that came out of this came out of comic books as well. So uh, I think one of them was, and one of my favourite scenes in this film, is when he slides down upside down and kisses MJ, which was just absolutely a nice little magical moment sort of thing. But like Dag said, he's, he's sort of traumatised by, you know, the death of, of Uncle uh, Ben and, and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, and then later on you see that potentially he may have caused it. So, uh, but yeah, Spidey's certainly up there for me. Um, and the only picture I couldn't find, which they took down straight away, was the, the teaser of this when uh, it was him with the spider web and the Twin Towers catching the helicopter and the trailer because it was just around the time of September 11, so they pulled that one down pretty quickly, which was a shame because it was a damn good teaser. Uh, and the very first of the Marvel franchise for this series, the, the Iron Man, the reason I like this the most out of probably most of them is, for, except for maybe a couple of little scenes, the CG in it is almost immaculate. And for back when it came out in 2008, I think, for memory, um it had it was almost believable completely believable you know the suit you couldn't tell that it was him in a green suit for the most most part and all that sort of stuff so a lot of the effects were absolutely brilliant in that uh series or that particular film and then it went on from there so they're my three next ones yeah i agree um from the marvel point of view i gotta admit iron man was like an absolute winner from day one of all the characters they could have picked they picked that and because everybody's thinking why are they picking this this dude he's just come out of nowhere and it was just it was just worked on so many levels and i always like the fact that at the start when he's in the humvees out in the iraqi desert and like it starts with explosions of people getting killed and all the rest of it gets put in the cave it has a really sort of serious side to it uh and i actually really appreciated that which uh, i think set the tone of the film and made people just really gravitate to it so uh yeah it was a good call on marvel's behalf uh, to make it that way and you're right it just looked absolutely outstanding um it's funny you mentioned earlier about in spider-man where he comes down and he kisses mj upside down um i actually heard the, the actors talking about that scene in real life and they said it was a real pain to do because all the water kept running up his nose yeah. and he <laughs> blood and Karen, he couldn't breathe and all the rest of it <laughs> took the magic right out of it actually uh which i thought was quite funny and just quickly uh someone has mentioned about um like the shadow i mentioned the shadow and rocketeer and the third film of that group is The Phantom. Um, the Phantom is a good film, but the one thing I didn't like about it was the scene where the guy gets the spikes in the eyes, and I, that, I won't watch it because of that. It was that, that was just something I just didn't appreciate at all, and I thought it was unnecessary. But you are right, they are. They do sort of go together as a bit of a, a trio of films because they're roughly set in the same era uh, in the mid-20th century. Um, Jeffro, did you want to go back to your last three at all? I'll go through uh, very briefly. These are just honourable mentions now. All the other guys essentially have picked uh, very uh, obvious ones. So I'll just go very not obvious. So here we have uh, Shaq, who obviously is mostly known for playing basketball. Uh, and if you love Shaq, baby love Shaq, because he's in this movie called Steel. And uh, he is a, um, a superhero. And if you want to ever see an actor shoehorned into a movie, this is probably <laughs> the best example. So uh, it didn't do well in the box office. Uh, but uh, I thought, well, if it's a forgotten uh, classic, well, at least it's forgotten. But I thought I'd throw it in my uh, my list. So Do you know why they made the film? Sorry? Do you know why they made the film and they called him Steel? Uh, no. So go back to the comics very quickly. Superman died in the comics, got killed by Doomsday, and four Supermen arose, and one was a, a suit basically powered, uh, which was Steel. So he was one of the four supermen that arose from the death of Superman. There you go. And uh, I love the tagline, heroes don't come any bigger. Well, he's a big guy because he's a basketballer, so duh. Anyway, let's move on from um, Steel. Um, someone had just mentioned that they actually own the Spider-Man poster with the Twin Towers in it too. Yeah. And if you know the history of Spider-Man, they had to digitally remove all the references to uh, the World Trade Center when the film was released. So can we move on? Now, the, uh, the best Batman movie whatsoever, bar none, is the classic 1966 uh, Batman movie. So Adam West, Burt Ward, 
the uh, the only time where they got all the uh, the major supervillains in on the uh, the one screen, whereas they used to have their own episodes. So I thought worthy shout out for the classic Batman, the the original and the best. Depending and on I can tell you, as a true story, at the Astor Cinema, they were showing Batman uh, once every month, and they said if you come in costume, you get him for free. And of course, wearing a Batman suit was way too hard back in the freaking eighties or whatever it was. So I got to dress dressed up as Robin, you know, with a red shirt and uh, yeah, I can't, I can't stand Robin. But he had to wear the yellow towel around the neck and all the rest. Of it. Got him for free. It was all worth it in the end. So uh, there you go. <laughs> the um, the, the uh, I remember going to some of those uh, screenings and the uh, the bat shark repellent got the biggest ever laugh. It's Absolutely. the anti bat shark repellent. Mm -hmm. like anti barracuda, the anti uh, stingray, and I can't remember the fourth one. So, uh, and, yes. And the um, the other brilliant bit is where he's on the uh, the pier, and he's yeah. got the bomb, and it's like he's just about to throw it off, and it's like there's a little duck, I think, in the water. It's like yeah. some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Yes, absolutely fantastic. The only downside to the whole movie is the fact that they couldn't cast Lee Merriweather. Uh, sorry, Jill Newmar because she was un unavailable and they had to replace with uh, Leah Merriweather. It's the only like downside. I mean, she was still good, but because Julie Newmar had been associated with Catwoman, it wasn't exactly the same. But uh, anyway, yep, good choice. Very good. Got the next, yeah, last one. The, the, yeah, the chemistry wasn't there between uh, Catwoman and Batman at all in that Hang film. On. Yeah, sorry, MPS, what was that? I said the chemistry between Batman and Catwoman wasn't there at all in that film because of that change, which was a shame. Right. Now, here's a trivia question for you. What was her Russian name? Uh, oh, it was on the tip of my tongue before. What? Yeah, I'm going to kick myself because I can't think of it off the top it's, of my head. It's uh, Kitka. No. Yeah. yeah, that's the cut down version. What's the long version? Oh, yeah, come on, yeah, I can't think of it. Kitanya, Aranya, Kitanya, something rather Alisov. So, uh, and I was like, what? But my friends call me Kitka. So, uh, there we go. Das for Danya. There we go. Uh, I like how Angela Angela said anti shark repellent doesn't that doesn't mean it will repel sharks. Well, it kind of did, and it kind of didn't. He started to kick the crap out of it, and uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. up in the end, exploding well, shark. If you, if you think about the logic of it, the shark's biting into his leg. He's punching it, so he's actually piercing his skin, which never gets pierced. There's no blood whatsoever, and the shark falls down and explodes later on. You know, so yeah. someone's having a bad day. Yeah, exactly right. And Tracy has mentioned that Julie Newmar was in the Star Trek original episode series. Uh, what was the name of the episode, Trace? So good job. There you go. I thought, I thought you oh, mentioned no, it. No, it's Friday's Child. You got the wrong day of the week. <laughs> it's <a> Friday's Child. Friday's <laughs> Child. You're one day too early. So there you go. Very good. All right, Jeff, off you go, mate. And finally, uh, I was a big fan of the Power Rangers when I was a kid. And to be able to see this movie was really fantastic. The interesting part is that it was actually filmed in um, Sydney. So no matter when they're running around the streets and all that, you can sort of spot all the uh, iconic um, uh, Sydney locations. So uh, go, go Power Rangers. Now, I wasn't a big fan of the remake, but I guess when you've seen the, uh, the best, you can forget the rest. So um, Power Rangers for me. Actually, I was just rereading Angie's comment saying if it's an anti-shark propellant that means it doesn't repel sharks that i suppose that makes a bit of sense doesn't it it's like send down the anti-bat shark repellent bats oh whatever <laughs> who cares you're lucky, oh, it wasn't, you're lucky it wasn't the anti you're lucky it wasn't the anti-shark repellent oh golly very good actually the cool thing about just back to the gold batman of course you got to see the bat boat and the bat cycle and the helicopter and the whole thing it all sort of was, it was gizmos galore in that movie so uh there you go. Very, very cool. I'll tell you a funny story. Okay, here's a funny thing. I actually put this on my website just like two days ago. So, uh, and Jeff will, will, may remember this. So, it's to do with this bloody movie, right? This is a true 100% story. I'm just going to just deviate for a second, right? I've, as you, a lot of people know, used to do uh, auctioneering at Skyforce and Star Wars meetings and whatever else. But I've never actually really attended a professional auction where you hold up the numbers and all sort of crap. Never really done that. But on this one occasion back in the 1990s, I did because they had the Australian release movie poster of this film, right? So it was the 1960s issue of Batman, the Australian movie poster, and I thought I went with Jeffro and I went together, and I said, okay, I'm actually going to register at a professional auction, get my number and everything, and I was only there for one item, and I only had 50 bucks on me. That was it. This is back in 1995 or something. And I thought we waited like six hours or 10 hours or 30 hours, 100 hours for this bloody thing to come up. Finally, 
they're about to say, and the next item, item number 300 and whatever, and I've got my thing and I'm ready to go. I've got my 50 bucks in my hand. And they go, that's the Australian release of Batman the movie. Da, 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 da. Reserve is, and he, if you could do this in slow motion, he said $50. And by the time my brain said, oh, that's all the money I've got, a million numbers went up. And before you know it, it was up to 180 bucks or something. So I didn't even get to hold my thing up once. And the guy who bought it was sitting right in front of me, you bastard. So um, there you go. Just sort of share that story with you because it's like it's ingrained in my memory. There you go. All right. So well, we, we can share another quick story too, Dags, if you want. Well, well, remember when we went to the US a couple of years ago? I took you guys to the original Batcave. Oh, uh, yeah. The, uh, chip, I've got Bronson, what's called. Bronson, Bronson Canyon. Canyon. Yeah, yeah, Bronson yeah, yeah. Canyon, yeah. Rods and Caves. We, we took the boys down there and we checked out the original 60s Batcave. Yeah, very, very cool. Yeah, very, very good. La, 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 la. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so uh, I'm just seeing what people have been writing here. Yeah, there we go. Some people have been liking the old Power Rangers, so uh, there you go. All right, so yeah. it's back to me, then we'll go back to MPS. So um, in my list of uh, movies that I, I kind of liked, um, one thing I do like, now Tracy, I know who's watching this, is a huge Watchman fan and loves the comics. And like, I never read the comics, but I was intrigued by the film. I'd heard about it. I heard it was something a bit different, a bit unique. Uh, and, you, Jeffrey, you would have seen this. This would have been up your alley, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I saw it and um, I, it didn't really grab me. I mean, I love the television series, but I thought this was just just missing something i don't know what it was i mean uh, and i know this movie has gone through several cuts so zack snyder has sort of uh, said oh this is this cut and then there's been another cut it's almost been like uh, blade runner sort of in terms of a, the number of times it's been um uh recut but uh, it didn't really grab me I, I mean i wanted to i mean i knew the comic but i said just something about it just i couldn't get into yeah, uh, Tracy's right. Graphic novel, not comic. My mistake. Yep, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. I'll wear that. Um, I actually quite enjoyed it. It was very dark, very violent, and very adult. Um, but because I didn't know who the characters were, and I was just watching it purely from someone who just likes watching movies, uh, I liked the idea of what they did with it. And um, a lot of it really centers around the, the Rorschach character and he has the ink blots sort of thing moving on his face and all this sort of business. And it was a very interesting and very unique story. And uh, Something well worth looking at. Beautiful cinematography. Oh, it's just been filmed really, really well. Um, the thing that I found interesting uh, after doing a bit of reading about it recently, it is a bit cockeyed in its time zone because it's saying it's set in the 80s when the Cold War uh, was in, in vogue. And, of course, now we know that the Cold War doesn't exist anymore. So to a large degree, you've got to reset your brain and to think, oh, yeah, this is back when the USSR was a bit of the, bit of the bad guys. Um, and what's really bizarre is they have a character, and I can't remember his name, uh, Tracy will know it, is a big blue dude right but he walks around naked and they don't even bother trying to hide anything so they just go yep there you go if you want to see a, a blue schlong a, it's everywhere so uh and and i think uh, to their credit good on them rather than trying to do the old oh this is in front of this this is in front of that and he's actually a major character for the for the movie and uh, is quite significant for the story but oh, uh, if you haven't seen watchman it is something a little bit it is actually very different from what you would have seen in other shows and uh the way they sort of the way it starts off is really good. I found it's an excellent movie to watch with headphones on, turned up really loud because it just has a really explosive uh, feel to it. So, um, yeah, and Tracy's going to say, look, there's a gigantic octopus in the comic and the graphic novel doesn't appear in the movie yet, whatever. But, uh, yeah, it was all very good, very groovy, and uh, I've got to say I very much appreciate it. So uh, if you haven't had a chance, uh, check it out. Uh, two more for me. Uh, I did like The Dark Knight. Sorry, MPS, but it did work for me. I was I thought it was an excellent film. I did like the fact that you had two really really strong characters the only downside to the movie it was probably a little too long after you got rid of the whole joker scenario you go beauty end of the movie oh hang on we've still got to deal with two-face uh and that sort of just dragged it out a little bit but uh be that as it may i thought the characterizations were really really good and it was good to see batman put through his paces and uh, in fact that uh, he did have a bit of a hard day at the office uh to a large degree and i like the idea of the copycats the fact that he's a superhero and all these dudes are trying to copycat him you know, these normal guys in the street, so he's having to deal with that as well. And I thought that because that would happen in real life, you know, vigilantes saying, Well, we're going to be just like you and we're going to help you. And of course, it's just a hindrance more than anything else. And um, yeah, and I did like Two Face, I thought he was actually very, very well done. Certainly, way better than what they did in Batman and Robin by a long shot. Um, and my lucky last one, I actually really liked X Men, the first X Men movie that came out. Never read the comics, don't know anything about it whatsoever. I just heard it was a big deal what was coming out in 2000, I think it was. 
and I sat back and watched it. I thought, you know what, I actually don't mind it. I, I quite enjoyed it. I thought the characterizations were good. Strong male characters, strong female characters doing their thing. The only problem, of course, now is whenever you have TV shows or movies where you've got characters who have abilities, it just seems to be copying X-Men. You know, Heroes, the TV series, it was just like bloody X-Men without the costumes. So uh, that's how I interpret it. But I thought the first movie, there's been a lot of movies in the X-Men series and millions and billions of the damn things. But I thought, yeah, you can't really go past the first one. The first one was quite good. Logan at the other end was very good, very, very dark. Uh, but uh, I thought they actually did very well overall. So uh, considering I knew nothing about the uh, the comic, I thought, yep, yeah, good on. So very, very cool. So there we go. So MPS, we're going back to you. Yeah, let's go. Cool. Done. There you go, sir. I only got a few more. Blade, Wesley Snipes, another Marvel sort of comic. Never read the comic, but I love the film. Love the film. It's a fantastic bit of uh, vampire. It wasn't sort of a... It was interesting because he's half vampire himself sort of thing, so it wasn't like he was human trying to fight vampires or vampires fighting vampires. It was half and half. So the fact that he... he could walk through the day and all that sort of stuff. He was called the day walker, all that sort of stuff. It was it was a interesting sort of take on uh, a vampire film. And some of the fight scenes were quite good. You know, there was a little bit of blood in, in some of them because you've got to um, uh, take out the blood from all the people and make the evil come out even more and all that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, it was still a good film. One of my favorites, a little bit lighter, Condor Man back from the late 70s with Michael Crawford. So from this to uh, Phantom, the, Phantom of the Opera to what was his um, oh, what was oh, his other character? Uh, uh, no, sorry. Yeah, some others who have him. That's right. Yeah, some others yeah. who have him. What was his character name, though? Frank Spencer. Frank Spencer, Frank Spencer thank you very much. Three very different uh, pieces from this guy. But Condor Man has always been a bit of a favourite. It's in the video collection or the DVD collection uh, when it came out years ago. And there's something I think that I love about someone with wings or capes or that can fly. So bats and birds, you know, Blue Falcon, Batman, all that sort of stuff. Um, and the last one for me, you got to talk about the turtles because it was mm -hmm. a big, big thing back in the day, back in 1990. And even though... You had oh, which which Corey was it that was in one of the suits? Um, was it Feldman? I think yeah, so. it was one of the Corys for memory. Uh, that was a bit of an interesting play to sort of have him be one of the turtles. Uh, it was really really good on the day. The suits were great. The the movements were good. I didn't like April O'Neil the actress, um, and then the second movie was just. It was okay, then it went down from there, and there's been many, many versions of them since. Uh, the only other thing that would be as good as as this movie would be the original cartoon series. So, and Kevin Eastman was out, was it this year? Yeah, it was this year at, at um, uh, Supernova and many, many years ago at uh, Armageddon. So, uh, yeah. That's it. You're actually correct. I mean, I remember when this came out, we saw it in the cinema and it was like, oh, my God, that is just like awesome. I mean, how they've done the turtles. They look absolutely fantastic. It could have been cheap and nasty. I know they had the Jim Henson company involved and yeah. they were stunning. That worked really, really well. And of course, the ultimate quote that came out of that movie is, of course, forgiveness is divine, but never pay full price for a late pizza. Mm, yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, the, the faces and the heads were animatronic. Anima, animatronic. Uh, while the rest were sort of working, you know, hands and feet sort of thing. But think about the, the guys in the suits doing all the fight scenes, jumping up and down and doing all that sort of stuff. That was a, you know, you got a suit that's probably twice as much in terms of weight as the person in it. Uh, so they did pretty good. And the storyline was good. It sort of didn't take away from the, from the cartoons, um, even though comics were the first uh, version of, of it anyway. So... Um, and everything sort of seemed to be really good in it. It was just, it was a decent, decent hero film. Yeah, I remember um, uh, one of the guys in the production had said when they designed uh, Shredder, they just said, wouldn't it be great if you had a guy with um, shred, like, uh, you know, like shredding for like onions and stuff on his arms. And that's where the idea came from for, his, for, the, for the wrist. They said he put shredders on his arms and that's where the name came from. So there you go. How cool is that? So very good stuff. Now, MPJ brought up Deadpool uh as a choice i've only ever seen the film once and it was very i didn't mind it was actually quite different i don't know what you two think as an option 
big fan. I really enjoyed the humour. Ryan Reynolds is uh, just one of the funniest guys on the planet, I think, at the moment. So uh, he can do no wrong. And, I mean, it was adult, but, you know, it's just... Um, it's a bit like uh, Toxic Avenger, you know. There's a, there's a bit of violence there, but, you know, it's it's almost a little bit cartoony, so you can forgive it. So, uh, yeah, big fan of uh, Deadpool. Yeah, I, I am too. Look, I've got most of the... Actually, I've got all the recent Marvel films. I've, I've got a fair few comic book films in general. So, like you were saying, Dave, before X-Men, I've got most of those. Uh, so I'm not really a Batman or DC or a Marvel sort of person. I'll get all the superhero films I can get my hands on because most of them are good in some way, shape or form. Uh, and it's good to have a reference, but Deadpool was certainly good too. Was equally as good. I wouldn't say it was any better. It was, it was certainly wasn't worse. Uh, and then they did a release with Fred Savage, uh, where Deadpool's reading the story of the movie to Fred Savage, but he's got him all kidnapped. Um, <laughs> That's <laughs> quite funny, actually. So, uh, yeah. Um, it's very funny. Michelle's brought up things like Green Lantern and that maybe one day we will discuss um, superhero movies that definitely did not cut the mustard, but uh, <laughs> yeah. have so, much hate, so much hate can only go around. Was it It was Green Lantern or Green Arrow? Yeah, One yeah. Of the Green, Lantern. Oh, Green Lantern, yeah. And yeah, Ryan yeah. Reynolds was in that too. Yeah, yeah. He, so. he takes a shot at that. I think in... In one of the films, he takes a shot at it uh, in, towards the end... Um, in the end credits, he takes shots at certain aspects, and one of them is he shoots himself before he picks up the script for Green Lantern. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very clever. It's very clever. Um, the good news is there's a lot of good superhero movies out there covering a vast range of uh, topics. Not just, I mean, recent years has just been sort of Marvel dominating everything, but uh, you sort of spread your mind out a little bit, and there's a whole lot of uh, other options out there, depending on what your tastes are, whether you like the more kiddie stuff or the more violent adult stuff. And um, if you just want the classics, away you go. Uh, you Just very, very quickly, Superman the movie, why it worked for me is I love the, the cinematic element of it and the long story, the fact they spent half the movie just developing the main character before they got the suit on, before he started going to Metropolis, and all that development um, and the whole thing with... Uh, Krypton and how that was done with Marlon Brando and everything. It's just cinematically, it was actually a masterpiece more than anything else. So, And I personally believe, personally, the sequence where you first see him take off, he's in the distance, you say you've got Jarrell's head and it goes through his head and you've got him in the distance or he's in the distance and he takes off and he flies and he does that. One of the greatest cinematic moments in the history of cinema. Absolutely gorgeous. And you did believe he could fly. So there you go. Very good stuff. So, and there's been actually some fantastic comments coming through as well too. I love that one. I don't know who it was. Number two sucked. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but there's plenty of sequels that did suck. So uh, there you go. Um, PJ said kick ass. Actually, that was going to be one of Jeff Rose. But it was uh, going to be one of mine. Yeah, I love that series. Very, very cool. So uh, there you go. It was something a little bit different. Anyway, let's time to move on. Oh, golly. So uh, all right. So enjoy the rest of your weekend. Absolutely fantastic. As Jeffro mentioned, not next Wednesday, the Wednesday after. Talk nerdy to me. We're back again next Wednesday's Boss Isley Monthly for all your Star Wars stuff. So there you go. Anyway, Friday night's been good. Great, wonderful. But we've got to go out and visit people now. So uh, we'll leave you all to it. And remember, it's always important to <gasps> stay nerdy. Stay okay. nerdy.